Welcome, travelers. We're aware that your journey was difficult, but prepare to have your questions answered, for you have been granted an audience with the Masters of Modern. And welcome back to Masters of Modern. I'm your host, Alex Kessler, here with my co-host, Ben Bateman. You, you know, it's unbelievable that after all this time, you're only just now adjusting to the fact that your audio, when you say and, is so much louder than the rest of the show. Like, I think you almost properly adjusted that live. You're like a live technician where you're moving the things on the soundboard. I've, 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 this Thanksgiving break has, has it's a new, I'm a new Kessler. Unbelievable. It's all new, all <laughs> a brand new outlook on life. Yeah. Well, I, I'm sleeping at the exact same, I don't know, I have no, I'm not, you were trying to come up with something that was really now, yeah. amazing. I've been to a football game. I went to my first football game. That's the new. Oh, geez. It's boring. I don't, I don't get it. What game did you go to? Uh, the Egg Bowl, which is Ole Miss versus Mississippi, oh. ugh, Mississippi State. College. College football. Got it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The Egg Bowl. It's like they're like Mississippi State or Miss, Ole Miss is like a yeah. an institution. It, yeah. They're considered the number one tailgaters in the country. Yeah, we I did a, a quiz the other day. Um, this this is my ten second sports tangent. Okay, can take longer than ten seconds. Um, uh, and the qu- question was: There's fifty teams in the history, or sorry, there's six teams ever that have had a draft pick from their school taken in every draft the last fifty years, fifty years straight without. Okay. And it was like a quiz to win something. And I, like me and my partner were like, oh yeah, we know we guessed Old Miss is one of the six because we're like, there has to be. They're like an institution. Sure. Dead wrong. And like, okay. we guessed all the six we guessed were wrong. And I know a lot about sports. Oh wow. I was, I struck out 100%. If you listen, if anybody listens. You should, you should this, be embarrassed. Like football, like some of the ones we guessed <laughs> just for the record were like, we guessed Old Miss, we guessed Penn State, we guessed UCLA, we guessed Alabama. None of those. They were all wrong. Like those are like some of the biggest programs. It was like Tennessee, Michigan, Michigan State, Florida, like also big programs. But. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of big. But I, I mean, the one good thing about Ole Miss is that at one point they actually the entire school chose and then was rejected by George Lucas for their mascot to be Admiral Akbar. It's a trap because they're the they're the Ole Miss Rebels. Yeah, but that like that's like a weird connotation version of Rebels. So they're oh. trying to find something more neutral. And Star Wars, you're the Rebel Alliance, yeah. so it worked. And then because it's so ridiculous, it got through. I wore a Rebels, I wore an Admiral Akbar shirt to the game. Two things: we're doing the thing where we ramble about something no one wants to hear about. So let's yes. move on to magic. But second thing. End of the podcast, just when you said Rebels, reminded me of a really, really fun game that I've been playing on Sundays that's a Star Wars-related football game that you will very much enjoy. Okay, we'll talk about the end of the podcast. Yes, All right, the so magic news time. Let's talk about magic news. We'll do the news, then we'll do all our plugs. Yeah, yeah, Cool, nice. You were doing that, and I just exposed That's the news. The news. Yeah, yeah. All right, so today in magic news, well, so two really big things happened. One, you did more research on, and I was in this football game apparently during this, so I wasn't able to watch as much, but World Championships happened. Yeah, we had like the Team Unified Modern Championships, um, and it was cool, and Greece won, and they had three decks, just like all of the teams, and I watched a lot of this. I must have had an actual full-scale like I was so tired or maybe like it was, maybe it was all the isn't it tryptophan what's the chemical in yeah. turkey that turns your brain off something I mean we had had like wine and stuff like that but nothing crazy I was in Boston visiting my uh, girlfriend's family I had met all of them it was a lot of fun um, and uh, at some point I watched hours of this between two different days I watched hours of, of this uh, and I like today when you were like what happened and I was like oh there was well uh, I saw this one deck and like couldn't piece it together. So looking at the results here, though, I did. I was reminded and saw some very cool stuff. Um, and uh, and we had. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go over the deck choices of the two teams in the finals because otherwise we're going to talk about 24 decks and it's just it's a lot. Take a lot. I, of mean, time. Uh, I do want to talk about one thing with something to keep in mind with Unified Standard as using this as kind of results of what the format looks like. Modern. Or sorry, Unified Modern or yep. Unified Constructed in general is you know the different players couldn't use the same cards in their deck other than basic lands, meaning that. You know, your deck choices for the teams were very specific on making sure people could play powerful decks without eating cards from other decks. So Yeah, it's actually it's it's like what we do in Highlander Roulette, which is actually a lot of fun, where you're choosing you're choosing you can't repeat yourself between decks. Right. But but more of the point is this isn't necessarily that true of what the format looks like. This is what the format looks like if you had to have two other players playing with you that you couldn't share any cards between the three of you. Yeah, so we had uh, we had Belgium lost in the finals to Greece. So the three decks chosen by the Belgium pl- the Belgian players were... Actually, the- technically I think I ate waffles and I had Greek food today. Yeah. So, cool. If, by the way, <laughs> if, by the way, if anybody listening to this is like... Th- 
the championships weren't during Thanksgiving. I could be dead wrong, and I could have done this another time. I just, I'm that blacked out on what happened. Well, the championships could have been the weekend before Thanksgiving. They might have been. I know that I watched. I was out of town for both. I know that I watched a lot of it, is the point. Right, it's let's the, yeah, let's so, talk about the next. Yeah. Uh, the Belgian players, we had uh, Jerome Baston. He was playing Goreo's Vengeance. So uh, this is a deck we've talked about before. Nothing in the list was here. It, was it a Grishel brand, or was it uh, like the, the Grixis version? Uh, this was the uh, Grishel brand. Version. Cool. Yeah. I, th- I actually like the Grishel brand more. It feels more unstoppable. Well, it definitely Man. feels more unfair. Yeah. I mean, the, just when you when you remove a World Spine Worm from your hand with Nourishing Shoal and gain 11 life, it's like kind of like one of those like, I'm doing really unfair things in there. Right. Yeah, right. The, like the, the, the one thing I would say, right now it seems like a little bit of a dangerous choice just because of the amount of dredge hate out there. Like I'm running with three surgical extractions in almost every deck because it just is good against dredge but also eats other decks and yeah. this seems like a deck that's really weak to that kind of hate. Yeah, definitely. I mean it's it's it is super glass cannon and we've said this before. So that was uh that was deck number 1. Uh their second deck that they were playing, seat B, was from Branco uh Nernik, uh Nerink, Branco Nerink, I think. It's a Naya Burn deck. Um and again, we have a pretty standard deck here. Uh looks like it's got four Eidolon in a deck with Goblin Guides and Nicodles and stuff. I know Eidolon has jumped in and out of these decks. It started originally as like a straight burn card, and now this is like... Well, no, so so uh, the main thing that's been jumping is Nicodle. Like, yeah. Eidolon's kind of been in burn forever. It's Nicodle has been picked up pretty heavily, though. The, I think it's pretty safely assume that Nakatl is the card you should be playing in burn. Yeah, I guess I'm, as I'm reading this list here, I'm seeing that it is actually just basically a burn deck with a few other off-color cards. Um, I was thinking more of this was like a zoo deck with... Eidolon, this no, is no, definitely no, a burn it's, deck it's, with green cool. and white yeah, cards. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, burn's been Naya forever, and they just realized that Nakatl is really good in the deck. Yeah, 100%. So that's their seat two. Um, you have uh, seat three, Peter Varen. He was playing Infect. There was an Infect deck in both the winning and losing team's uh, th- set of three. In here, again, you pretty much have the standard set. You have one copy of Radiant Corruptor main deck, which I think is something we've definitely seen here and there. Um, I like Radiant Corruptor. I've always thought that card is, is unique and cool and interesting. For those that don't remember what that card is, it's green, green, one for a 2-2 two, two infect when it enters the battlefield, destroy target artifact. Um, yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's like it's and it's like one of those... I played in a bunch of random commander decks, actually, just because having a source of infect damage is just a possible out against some random life gain moment or something like that. 100%. It's like I that green-white all-in deck in... Highlander has this card in it now because it's like this is a great way to kind of get double strike on going all in and also have a way to get rid of an artifact. Sure. So uh, yeah, otherwise though, two distortion strikes, which uh, again that's something we've seen go in and out of infect decks for a long time. Yeah, I like it's distortion strikes. It's a pretty stock infect list. It feels like. Yeah, yeah. It's, it doesn't have that much. So that's that was the uh, the Belgian lists. I'm going to look at the Greece, the, the Greek, Grecian, Grecian, Greek, Greek. It's Greek. I'm like stupid. <laughs> I'm a food. stupid person. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we've been calling Greek people Greek for thousands of years. <laughs> I just tried to pass off Grecian on the podcast. Like I think people have been Greek longer than any other written than yeah. Please don't turn this off. <laughs> <laughs> All right, see, okay, hey, we have decks. Were they playing? Uh, we have Bill Chronopolis. Sweet, sweet name. Do you kind of wish your last name was Chronopolis sometimes? Never. <laughs> it makes me feel like I'm a Chronozoa, but. Okay, what do you play? <laughs> all right, uh, Dredge. Today's been really rambly. I apologize to everyone. We've just, all the trip to fan from the turkey is still keep going and in our bodies. And I missed each other, so we just yeah. like to ramble about stupid things. Uh, yes, he's playing a Dredge list, so yeah, this is, to me, looks pretty much like what I'm used to seeing. Four Cathartic Reunion, which is like the superpower thing we've gotten sort of recently. That's yeah, this is, it's like a very stock list. I mean, well, the interesting thing about Dredge is Dredge is now just a giant pillar of the format. I mean, it, it, it is arguably the most prolific deck. A friend of the cast um, recently did use a, a concept that's used in machine learning to actually figure out what the diversity of modern is. And he expected, in fact, to be the most played deck in the format, but it's really Dredge. So um, here's what's really interesting about this. Um, I love, and this is one of the things that I love the most about modern, over time, we, we get super familiar with cards, right? Like, okay, we're, we've all been familiar with Narc Amoeba forever because it was a super big card in Legacy Dredge for the longest time, right? Blood Gas showed up in decks for years doing all kinds of different things. Stink We Dimp. So they print Prize Amalgam, and there's a whole bunch of conversation when they print that card. Like, is this going to be the thing? Is this going to be good? It has absolutely, as you've said, turned out to be the card. That's the thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but then you look and you're like, but also there's four copies of Insolent Neonate in here, and also there's four copies of Cathartic Reunion. Oh, no, yeah, this deck... Well, Cathartic Reunion wasn't necessary. The Dredge deck was already one of the best decks in the format before... Cathartic Reunion. Cathartic Reunion was printed. But 
obviously Neonite and um, Prize of Malgram are the reason the deck exists. Totally. What I'm, what I'm trying to say is it's interesting to see that the World Championship Dredge List is playing 12 cards printed within the last year. and like last six months, even. Really? Is Amalgam Nine that? months. Last no, nine Amalgam's months. a little older, right? Shadows of Innistrad, nine months. Yeah. So anyway, uh, without talking about that too much, it's yeah. It's aside from that, it's playing a lot of things we're used to seeing. So it's a very unfair deck. It's funny that they they're playing Dredge and the other guys are playing Grishel Brand. So they both have the kind of like way out the gates, just like go crazy in the first few turns of the game. Sure. Can kill you out of nowhere deck. Um, but they're also playing Infect, which is like the much more sort of like turn by turn calculated can kill you out of nowhere deck. I don't I don't know if I would agree with that statement. I think really uh, of the six decks. They're both playing two of their three decks are that kind of deck. Well, I was just going to say, so the next player, Petros Tiotis, is playing Abzan. Yeah, so I would say like... Polar opposite of Dredge. One, the winners, it sounds like, were playing Burn. No, no, these are the winners. Okay, the, the winners were playing two two heavily aggressive Dredge linear decks fact, and then Abzan. one control deck. And yeah. then the other one was playing three linear attack you face decks. Yeah. Yeah. So the Abzan list here played by Petros. Uh, again, this is something we're seeing a lot now. We have three li- three Liliana of Vale and one Liliana of the Last Hope. It's cool that Liliana, Liliana of the I can't say Liliana today. Liliana of the Last Hope is like a thing that's in modern now. A lot. It's like a was a very good card. And it definitely didn't get called as a shot when it first got printed as this is just gonna be in modern, but it's like all the Abzan, almost all of the Jund lists mm-hmm. are playing at least one. It still surprises me that Abzan decks haven't picked up Grim Flayers as heavily, just because of how powerful that card seems to be with Lingering Souls. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, maybe it's because just Red has better burn spells that kind of get, in, like, they have Tarfire. Not tar, yeah, Tarfire. That's the Goblin. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Tarfire and or um, the Red enchantment that you sack to do two damage to a thing, so they have oh, sure. better ways Seal to get... Fire. Um, Delirium online, yeah, but I, I would, I don't know. It feels like this is a deck that would make better use of the fact that Grimfire draws them three cards. It is fascinating that you have a pretty, pretty stock Abzan list here, in, and you know this is not like a, it's a concession to some degree because you're playing unified, so like you have to be clever. But I don't really feel like they did this. Well, okay, the dredge deck. I, no, but this is the lands. It's the lands. That's the thing that that's the thing you have to pay attention to. I guess what I was going to say was, but dredge doesn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At sure. this point, because the question I was going to ask was, Abzan versus Jund. At this point in modern, is there just a? I thought that just distinctly Jund was the better deck. It just seemed like at these days, Jund was always the choice. Interesting to see an Abzan deck playing three siege rhinos. By the way, like how many? Was the last time you saw three siege rhinos or four siege rhinos in like it's a world a, championship it's, it's or pre- like a top four? Pretty old drowsy. Yeah, it's been a while. That card was so ubiquitous for a while. Yeah, anyway, Lingering Souls, obviously, that's the that's the biggest reason you play. Which Lingering Souls is really good right now. The fact that it infects the best exactly. deck, arguably in the format, makes Lingering Souls extremely important. It's always been one of the best cards against them. Right. One of those like counterintuitive choices when like you think about you, you always you're like, okay, what's the thing that I can do? Okay, it's more targeted spot removal. It's more clever. It's like, no, just a bunch of 1-1 flying blockers is actually sure. the way to win. Um, and then the last deck in here is an Infect deck by, oh my goodness. Do you want to try this? Do you want to try this one? Pan- I think it's, wow, you just took the computer from me. I was going to try. Panagiotis Papadopoli- Papadopoulos. I think it's Panagiotis. Panagiotis Papadopoulos. I got the second half right. Papadopoulos? It's Papadopoulos. It's like the Doppler on a weather broadcast. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, again, here, you still got the two distortion strikes. Pretty similar. There's no, they, they don't have the, uh, the what's his name? The, the, the three, the two, two for three we just talked about. Um, he's yeah, not just a slightly different sideboard. Yeah, pretty yeah. much stock list. All right, so that's that's kind of, I mean, World Champions is really cool. I love unified formats yeah, in general because it makes you make really cool creative deck decisions. Um, if you go down to the format a little longer, there's some other cool decks. Like there's a Sun and Moon deck, uh, which has been really popular. It was just like kind of a new deck that's been showing up. But yeah, so that, that was World Championships. Uh, next on news, because we need to get kind of keep moving. We got a bunch of Aether Revolts, like spoilers. Yeah, four cards popped up. I'm not, in even, I'm not even sure how it came from. I'm not sure if Wizards announced it. What it is, is it was the game day. It was the like the poster that announces all of the different promos right. for Aether Revolt. That's what was spoiled. So there's this big Johnny Matt. So Johnny looks like he's going to be in the set. Um, and then you got, um, there was a black, I, I don't know the name of any of these cards, but there's... Oh, I, I, I think I actually out. have them right here. All right. Yeah, we have uh, Yah. Yahanis? Yahanis? Yahanis expertise. You know Yahini? Uh, I know who she is. Yeah, yeah. Tell well, us about it. Or she. I think it's a she. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, he, there, they, I didn't read the story. It came out, I think, today about what, 
what that character is, but they're a, are, they are a vampire Aetherborn. Oh, sweet. Which is sweet. I don't <laughs> know what their powers are. I don't know what the deal is, but that's all I know. But this spell is really, really, really sick. Unreal. It's a sorcery, black, black, two. All creatures get minus three, minus three until end of turn. You may cast a card with converted mana cost three or less from your hand without paying its mana cost. This opens up a lot of things. So you have you have the suspend cards from Time Spiral Block yeah, that don't officially have a casting that's cost. That's the big one. So the... the and the ones that pay attention to there, there's the white one, which is Restore Balance, which means that there is now a four-mana balance in the format. Yep. There's the red one, which is Wheel of Fortune. There's the blue one, which is which Ancestral, is Ancestral Visions, Ancestral Visions <laughs> which is probably the simplest one to play, just well, it, because it's... It's the one that will happen first. This will be slotted right into Grixis decks, because it are, does so many powerful things with that deck already, and just kind of does what Anger the Gods does. Oh my god, like four, four mana, minus three, minus three, draw three. <laughs> yeah, and that's, and that's like, that's not Magical Christmas Land, but like, you also have three... Damage all creatures plus Colgan's command. Yeah, or you have three damage all creatures plus Liliana the Veil gets put into play. Like, there's so many different here's, sweet options with this card. Here's the question: You draw your opening hand. You have Ancestral Visions. You play Yahini's Expertise on turn four, hoping you're going to be able to. They counter it, and you didn't cast your Ancestral Vision on turn one. Well, no, you always you always cast it on turn one. I'm yeah, just, yeah. It, just it's for when you draw it later. That's the noob play where you're like. Oh. The bad one is Restore <laughs> Balance, where you had the option to because Restore Balance is like a huge. Yeah. Really long availability so that them countering it really locks it into your hand. Yeah. Um, versus Ancestral Visions, which is a little bit more feasible. Uh, the other ones are the green one, which is... Hypergenesis. Hypergenesis, which is banned. Yeah, Hypergenesis is banned. And, and then the black one, which is Living End. Which is Living End, yeah. And, and that'll, you know, that it'll do... A, it, this easily can... I can see this being see, seeing play in Living End decks of the sideboard as just a, like, another option if they get a Living End stuck in their hand. I think there's actually... Keep, keep talking about this for a second, but I think there's actually a couple others that don't get, like, don't get a lot of discussion. I, I thought it was a cycle. I didn't think there was more than just five free I ones. might be thinking of the other suspend cards that actually have casting costs and they have like an alternative cost in the suspend. I think when you think of the ones that are like they have a, a huge casting yeah. cost and then there's the X spell suspend ones. Yeah maybe because I was thinking of the, uh, what's it I was thinking of what's it called the um, the black one. The black Curse one of that, the Cabal. Yeah yeah that, that, that is a huge cost. It's oh, not free. Oh got it. Okay I'm looking at all these. Yeah Curse of the Cabal has a 10 greater Gargadon. Yeah yeah you're right. So it is just that cycle it is just that cycle of one, two, three, four, five. And then you also have Lotus Bloom, which is the last one. Which, which is the artifact, which is yeah. Black Lotus. So this yeah. can cast a Black Lotus. It's a four mana Black Lotus, which is still really good. <laughs> like, there's a reason that most... Yeah. Uh, card's amazing. And that's just the free spells. And we, we were talking about a little bit with, with Grixis, where they have all of these other cards available Yeah, to like them. this into Colagon's Command is like pretty sick. Right. Or like even like this into Lingering Souls. Like there are so many three <laughs> mana or below spells yeah. that like Esper decks playing this seems sweet. John decks playing this like I mean just the idea of okay you cast this on turn four you destroy all creatures you make them discard a card and then you get back your best creature that you just killed with the other half of Colagon's command like yeah. that seems like oh my god the value is well, crazy like, you know the reason people generally have a problem with like minus two minus three doesn't kill everything there's a bunch of X fours in the format because lightning bolt proof but then you can cast the Colgan's command to kill the, the thing that was two. just above like yeah, yeah, this, yeah. this can kill a Tarmogoyf theoretically with a Colgan's command or a lightning bolt so like definitely this is going to be a uh, this. Seems like a, just a shoe in for modern. Just seems like a really powerful card. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is just one of those. It's it is a little bit one of those cards like when Link when um, Cavern of Souls got printed and people were like, it kind of feels like the last part just got slapped on the the. Uh, well, it definitely did. Uncounterable yeah, part. Yeah, yeah. And this is one of those things where you look and you're like, obviously, Languish is four mana minus four minus four. So if you can't make four mana minus three minus three, it's like just strictly worse and a recent <clears throat> printing. But the the relationship between the two effects is a little strange because it's like... There's you, a lot of threes in there. There's three threes. Yeah. it's. I mean, it's not bad. It's very yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. It's just it doesn't have like the sort of like the flavor where I'm like, oh, yeah, this represents that thing. It's like it's just a really powerful, valuable four drop that yeah. has lots of value. It's the best. <laughs> cool. um, the second uh, card we have is Trophy Mage. Which might... This first card was sweet. Um, this might be a favorite. Uh, so Trophy Mage is, is very similar to... Trinket Mage and Treasure Mage, uh, so it's where the middle of the pack, it's a one. two two for three, one blue, blue and, and two, two colorless. Yep. Uh, enters the battlefield, and you may search your deck for a three mana artifact. Yeah, so there's a couple things. A, it's a human wizard. Yep, human cool. wizard. So there's a few things here, guys. Um, anybody who has ever messed around with like a Grand Architect deck or like some like base blue mid rangey deck, whether it was in standard or in modern, knows it's very very fun to play these Trinket Mage, Treasure Mage type of effects. Um, there's a lot of versatility to it. They fit into sort of like Tezzeret decks. Um, we're yet to get to that point where there's that kind of like 
top tier grindy artifact deck in modern. Um, Trinket Mage is always, like Treasure Mage is never going to really see play. I mean, like there the reasons you need to search for a Worm Coil engine are generally just you should just play more Worm Coil engines. Yeah, and there's not like the reason you want a toolbox card is you want to be able to find these or what was the new a treasure treasure chest what was we decided no longer saying toolbox we're saying treasure box or whatever all right moving on that was like two weeks ago you don't remember that did i black out yeah maybe (laughs) (laughs) uh so so you know treasure mage isn't going to always be a big deal at least not right now the trick mage side has always been fringe playable in modern in every format in the history of magic that's been guaranteed playable in all kessler decks yeah i've definitely played with it multiple (laughs) times (laughs) taking at least two different gps um and multiple ptqs but beyond that (laughs) You know, one man artifacts are great for hate cards. That's what this. What's interesting to me about this is this is the closest thing the Stoneforge Mystic we have in the format. This can find sort of feast of famine. And yes, Batter Skull was the thing that made um, Cobblade just in, way too insane. But like, people forget that that deck dominated Standard be, for four months or three months before. Batter Skull was ever legal in the format. Yeah, I mean, there, that was to, to some degree, they're <laughs> saying that Trophy Mage is basically Trophy Mage is basically Stoneforge Mystic is saying like, yeah, Sleight of Hand is basically Ancestral Recall. It's like, yeah, it's <laughs> it's basically Brainstorm. I, I, I don't <laughs> think it's that different. I, I I do think it's like saying that Serum Visions is basically Ponder. Ponder. It's more. It's more like it's more like saying Sleight of Hand is basically Brainstorm. I mean, it's like eons of difference. But I hear what you're saying. So the other side. Well, because the thing with swords that suck is playing four of them is bad. Yeah, of course. And, and every other equipment tutor in the format that's existed so far has been not attached to a creature or has some other trigger effect that doesn't really work or is expensive. This for three mana for a two two. That's pretty good value. You get that sword is like still very good. You can play four of these, play that, and then just play. Two hate board cards, hate three drop artifact cards like Bridge from Below, Bridge or, from No, or Ensnaring Bridge, Ensnaring Bridge. Well, or, yeah. So we were just so let's so yeah. we were just talking about before we started recording some some of the ones that come to mind. So Ensnaring Bridge is the most obvious played three mana hate card right now in modern. That's mm-hmm. heavily played. Um, Oblivion Stone is a card that shows up. Yep. That's an interesting one you can get. Dampening Matrix if you want to get rid of all them artifacts. Dampening Matrix. Yep. Crucible of Worlds is one of those cards where you play it in decks, but you don't want to play that many of well, them. Like with the thing with Crucible of Worlds, I was thinking is with this your Tron matchup for blue decks becomes much better because you can just play two to four ghost quarters yeah and then have this in the sideboard and then just bring it in against tron search it up and now every ghost quarter is you can now just strip mine tron decks out of the format like there's so many cool little tricks you can do with this card I, obviously it's not stoneforge mystic right yeah yeah. but but stoneforge mystic is banned currently and this gets a lot of the this does a lot of very similar things and could do those things in modern this does a lot of really cool things even like trinosphere i mean there's there's uh, shackles. There's a lot of really, really, really interesting cards right. that exist in modern that you don't want to play that many of. That if we do start to get closer to that mid rangey Tezzeret style deck, this is a card that you could easily see yourself playing because ones. Look, I've done the same thing you've done with Trinket Mage. There's a few of them, right? Engineered Explosives, obviously. And mm-hmm. like we've all done the thing where we're like, well, a removal spell, you're like, oh, I guess I could play uh, Brittle Effigy. You're like, that seems okay. Ugh. But like, yeah, the three is a lot more is, powerful. Right, three is a lot more powerful, and, and there are more one drops and zero drops. Obviously, because I mean, beyond yeah. the fact that there's two, just there are more one drops in Magic that are, especially in Artifact Land. So, like, there is that difference, but the power level on some of these three drops is just so much more. And right now, the format's really weak to like Abrupt Decay isn't that good right now. The Dredge is, you know, Dredge is a bad matchup for John. Like, the reason Infect is so good at the moment is because Jeskai decks and Jun decks aren't seeing a ton of play. Because the rest of the format is hostile to them, which makes a deck like this a little bit more feasible. I'm really excited. Yeah, this card's um, great. So let's, let's let's cover the last two. They're a little less exciting. I think those first two are definitely the big ones. The third one is called Quicksmith Rebel. It's red and three for a 3-2 human artificer. Love the subtype artificer, by the way. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of them. When Quicksmith Rebel enters the battlefield, target artifact you control gains tap. This artifact deals two damage to target creature or player for as long as you control Quicksmith Rebel. Um, this is pretty cool if you're if you're playing some sort of like. Oh, it's a sweet card. I mean, it's not good in modern, but yeah, it's like a cool. It like, <laughs> if it was a three mana two one that did the exact same thing, it would be like the fringe discussion playable. Four mana three two is just like. Oh, it's four mana. It doesn't kill a person. <laughs> like yeah, it compared does, to other four mana spells, it does give you something cool, which is that it's a four mana card that represents the ability to do something when it comes down. Because like, okay, let's yeah, just, but it's it's like. 
Look at other four mana spells in the format. Agreed. I'm not saying this is like good, and I'm not saying this if is playable. Was, if it was a one four that did this, I'd actually be more interested. I'm not going to rule this out right away. This comes into play, enters the battlefield, trigger on the stack, Spellskite, already in play. You can redirect the lightning bolt they try to kill it with to the Spellskite. Now your Spellskite taps to shock for the rest of the game. That seems pretty cool. Um, I mean... I mean, it's cool. I'm not saying this card isn't cool. I'm saying that's not good for yeah, modern. Agreed. Um, um, you can't write I off... I do love the idea of like, oh, your dark stealing it doesn't do anything. Yeah. Uh, let me let me see it for a second. And then you're like, the guy, the artificer makes it into a yeah. thing that does stuff. Also, He's like... a cool guy. I like the guy. This with Dark Steel Citadel seems cool. Yeah. All right. So next card. <laughs> um, scrap, look, guys, if you're listening and you think this card's much cooler than Kessler does, you, you tweet at me. You tweet at Don't me. Don't you dare. <laughs> uh, last one we have here that's been revealed is Scrap Trawler. And this is a three mana artifact creature construct. It's a three two. When Scrap Trawler or another artifact you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, return to your hand, target artifact card with from your graveyard with lesser converted mana cost. You can get an artifact with two or less from your graveyard to your hand. True story, guys. Kessler called me today. Was, he's like, there's a spoiler. It's a three-mana artifact. <laughs> when any artifact goes to your graveyard, you can return another artifact with the same converted mana cost directly to play. I was like, wow, that sounds insane. I was like, he was like, yeah, it sounds pretty sick, right? It's I was like, that's definitely <laughs> not that card. <laughs> uh, Turns out it's a 3-2 creature that specifies less than and to your hand. Yeah, Still the, pretty good. the creature part of that doesn't <laughs> matter to me as much as the fact that the other half of the text yeah. doesn't work the same way. But yeah, no, I mean, it's a cool card. I like the design. Uh, I do think there's eventually going to be a deck that's all about sacrificing artifacts and getting value on it, and maybe this could be a piece of that deck. Greater, um, greater Gurgadon with, uh, with Wellsprings? Is that the no, deck you're talking about? No, not that deck. <laughs> all right, so <laughs> uh, so that's, that's, that's it for the spoilers that we saw. Uh, Johnny's showing up, it looks like. Um, I'm so stoked that we're in the middle of this artifact cycle. Yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. So, it's so it's really fun. sweet. All right, so... Next, now we're on the subject matter. But before we get into the subject matter of the podcast, let's talk about how you can find us. Let's talk about Squarespace. Just kidding. Um, let's. <laughs> I, listen, I listen to too many podcasts. Um, let's let's talk about. Nail <laughs> Kim. Um, so, guys, we're on Twitter. If you want to follow along with the conversation and you want to share your thoughts about how sweet of a card Quicksmith Rebel is, you can tweet at us. I'm Ben Bateman Media. This is Kess Wiley, and the podcast is at. The MM cast. Yeah, we're like six followers away from 2,700 followers. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I would love to get to 3,000 by the end of the year. That'd be sweet. Yeah, we only have a month left, I don't though. think that's likely. No. We'd have to, like, become famous. Yeah. Make us famous, everybody. All right, so beyond that, please uh, check out the Patreon. We announced last week that there's going to be some changes, but... Uh, starting in January, there'll be a cool swag box that works a little bit differently where we just give you cool content that we think you'd like, be it a deck box from a new company, be it uh, cool ties, so, you know, something that we think you'd like as Magic players. Yeah, it's a um, little bit less, it's a little bit less uh, Masters of Modern brand specific and a little bit more Masters of Modern lifestyle, the way we live and things we like and things we think our listeners yeah. would like, and that's what it's going to be about. So if you guys like that idea and you want to get on board with it, um, that is patreon.com slash the MMcast. Right. Uh, beyond that, um, follow the YouTube channel. That's the most, the next most important one. Make sure to check out uh, our YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash top decking TV. Uh, there you can see YouTube version of this. There'll be deck lists. If you don't know the cards we're talking about, images will pop up, show you what the cards look like. Mike Clary does that for us. Sometimes he throws in funny little things, making fun of us in the video. It's good. Yeah, uh, definitely. Go, go watch, subscribe. Uh, and and we're then currently, you can currently find the audio on collected.company. That's where we are now. We've been rocketjump.com. We have Jimmy and Josh who do also their content on uh, collected.company and they have their own YouTube channel. And that is the Command Zones Commander Podcast. It's awesome. It's great content. Yep. Right uh, now they've been doing these cool battle videos where they're fighting with different of the new decks. It's really cool. Definitely check them out. And stay tuned, guys, because on the subject of video, we have like a really, really cool announcement that we'll elaborate on soon, and we don't have the details put out there yet, but we have teased it for a while, and it's finally getting close to fruition, so it's going to be real, real cool. We can't wait to share it with you guys. Um, let's talk about today's subject. Oh, wait, 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 last thing. I wanted to just shout out a big thank you to Star City Games. They featured us. In, oh, their, yeah. uh, in their news show that they do on YouTube, uh, and it was so cool. We got we got tagged on Twitter, and I was like, wow, people listen to this show. That's amazing. I was like, I can't believe this. Somebody knows that we do this podcast. So, Yay, and that's thanks to you guys. We appreciate it. Like our song from last week. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, subject of the matter is... We are going to be talking about the format Frontier and kind of what it means. So for those who don't know... Uh, 
the Japanese store and kind of a merchandise creator, Haruya, I think I'm saying that correctly, uh, created the format from Tier. It starts in the set M15. It's an eternal format or a non-rotating format um, that currently is a lot of just the last kind of big decks from the last five years. Um, they created it for a few reasons, but you know, you know, like other formats, like Eternal, like other ones, it kind of has picked up more steam than those other made-up formats. Uh, now uh, Toronto has been adding it to some of their big uh, tournaments out there. It's becoming part of side events. It's kind of a format that's picking up steam. And we kind of want to talk about this alongside a couple other pieces of information and kind of show where Magic is right now. Yeah, so let's just quickly talk about, just because people might be a little bit un unclear about exactly how far back this does go. So let's count backwards on the sets. And correct me if I'm wrong here, because I, M15, I get a little hazy. But M15 we have, is the Garrick. M15 so, is yeah. the Garrick set. Wait. So I'm going to count backwards. You tell me when to stop. We have Kaladesh. Okay? Yep. We have Shadows of Innistrad, Eldritch Moon. We have... Not in that order, but yes. We have Battle for Zendikar, Oath of the Gatewatch. Okay, we're going to go that way. Yeah. yeah. Yes, correct. So we far. have Cons of Tarkir, Fate Reforged, Dragons of Kar Tarkir. Correct. Uh, and before that, do we include any of Theros, Born of the Gods, or Journey of the Nyx? We do, right? Yeah. Okay. So you have Magic Origins, then you have Theros, Born of the Gods, Journey of the Nyx. And then it and cuts then off? Yeah. Okay, you're positive about that? Oh, I, sorry, no, no, no. You don't have Theros. That's what I thought. You don't have Theros. Blocked. That's what I thought. Correct. Yeah, I think that it's I think that it's, it's M15, it's M15 Origins. Theros, M15, Cons, Origins, Battle for Zendikar. Shadows. Shadows. Kaladesh. Kaladesh. That makes more sense. Yeah. That makes more sense. So yeah, it is it is kind of like an amalgamation of what the what old Overextended. It's like the like. last three standards combined. It's the or like, new extended. Overextended was the Gavin Berry format. New extended was the one where they like took extended and they shortened it, and it was like four years so, so basically. For, so, so kind of, and this is important for today's conversation actually to kind of explain what rotating formats used to be. So before modern, the precursor to modern was the format that kind of wizards wanted to be where standard cards would rotate into was extended. And they and worked on this for a long time. Right. And there was many versions and it never caught on as an actual loved format. It, right. was one it of those... started out as, as eight years back, yep. I believe. And then they shortened it into four years back. So instead of standard, which was two, it was four. And kind of, you know, there are different reasons it was unpopular. With the four year, one of the big reasons was people don't want to play the same decks they were playing in standard. Like it was also right after a period where we had like a big bad four years in a row. So like it was literally fairies into Jund into Cobblade, Cobblade yeah. or into Valka into Cobblade into um, Delver. And it was just like only those decks were like the big ones with a few side examples which is why there was a pretty pretty restrictive band list that Modern was launched with originally. That band list was basically trying to take out the key card to most of those popular standard right. decks. That's so that, why... Um, that's why Bitter Blossom was originally on the band list. Right. That's why Valakut was originally on the band list. Right. Um, a lot of those big decks. I mean, that's why we don't have Stoneforge Dredge, Mystic. Cards, that's yeah. why we don't have Jace. It's why we didn't have Grave Troll. Uh, a lot of these things have been unbanned, and Modern has become a very cool format because of it, but it's taken five years. Right. And... and but, you know, that was one of the big reasons with just right, new extended. But the problem with a rotating eternal format is, I guess, a longer term format than standard is the older you get, the more likely cards are going to be expensive, just from a scarcity perspective. And when people are investing $60 into Goyf, which was the problem with original <laughs> extended, and that was going to rotate, it became very unpopular and people would only play it during... Uh, the, the PTQ season that it, you had to play it. So it became this kind of unpopular format. Modern allows people to invest, by being a non-rotating format, it allows players to invest in a set in a way that they're not going to be, you know, they don't, it doesn't rotate ever again. If I spend $120 on a Tarmogoyf right now, I'm never going to have to worry, excluding bannings, that Tarmogoyf is not going to be playable. So if, this, if the first set that was, that was released, this goes back to M15, so this is basically two and a half or so years of cards, correct? Is that where, is that where I'm getting? We're about to enter 2017? Uh, it's about three. Okay, so about three years of cards. Now, I think the reason this exists, and stop me here if I'm wrong, because I, I saw there was a, a very long conversation that happened on our Twitter over the last couple of days, mm -hmm. and I was checking in, but this is one of those ones where my phone was buzzing like every 10 seconds, and it was clearly that you were agitated. <laughs> I wasn't agitated. Not, it was not, a very not, healthy conversation. Not in an angry way, but in like a, your fingers were moving incredibly fast way, and there was no way I was going to be able to read this conversation until it was done. Um, sure, maybe. Because we both get the same stupid alerts from the Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I, so I saw this happening, and I was, I was kind of loosely paying attention, but Modern, when it, when it started, only went back to 03, and it was launched in 2010, I think, 2011, 
which means you only had, at that point, seven or eight years of cards. At this point, we're now looking at 13, 14 years of cards, right? So it's it's literally almost doubled in the time that since they since they announced and launched the format. We're getting close to double the amount of cards being legal. It's doubled the amount of standard decks. It's doubled the amount of everything. So it is a much, much more vast, expensive, and uh, sought-after format now than it was when it launched, which means Frontier, if it's three years of cards, is a lot closer to where Modern was when Modern started in the first place. And I can see where people are thinking, like, Modern no longer represents this whole, like, it's a way for me to keep my standard cards. Most players that are getting into Modern now are like, I had nothing to do with any of the sets or any of the level of competition in any, in any of the first decade of these sets. Like, I, unless you guys reprint them, I'm going to have no ability to get these cards for reasonable prices because I wasn't even aware Magic existed at that time. So I, I think there's a little bit there's a little bit of that. I do think part of the problem here is that modern is uh, expensive. Though, I mean, if you look at reprints of the last year, they're getting better at kind of printing cards into the format. So, yes, these players didn't play during these blocks, but they played Eternal Masters or they played Modern Masters 1 and 2. And so these cards are getting put into their hands. I think the bigger issue here is m magic isn't growing like it used to. Magic during our period when we started playing this game and when Modern first started showing up, 20% growth every year. That yeah. means that's 20% new players added to Magic that go through the classic Magic cycle of play, which is you start out, you draft a little bit at your store, you start building a little bit of a collection, you buy some intro decks, you start trading some people, you build your first standard deck, and it's just made it of kind of the jank out of your standard deck. Then you're like, oh, I, I, bit, I have the bug. I'm going to start building a more competitive standard deck, trading for more expensive cards, spending more money, and then after... And once you get to the next year, you're like, oh, I have all the cards you need to actually build a standard deck because now I have all the old cards from last set and the new set. I have a standard deck. And then you hit your first rotation. And you're like, oh, crap. All that money I spent on these cards is now just gone. I don't want to invest too much into this new standard because... I'm going to lose money. I'm going to lose money. So you start thinking, okay, look, let me look at modern. And you can then invest in the modern. And that's kind of what the classic play pattern was. And you know, part of that conversation on Twitter was... Magic still prints cards that are good in modern. Like if you invested in the Eldrazi cards yeah. in standard right now, those will be good in modern for a very long time. If you invested in Collected Company, if you invested in Colgan's Command, like every set for the last four sets has introduced many pop powerful cards into modern. So it's not like those cards won't cycle into that, but modern is still expensive. There are all the other cards you don't have access to. Right. And standard started rotating on top of the fact that now... So, okay, so, <laughs> sorry, I jumped ahead a little bit. We have this aging population. So Magic's population is no longer growing at the same rate. We no longer have 20% being added. Do you know that for a fact? Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. Was it like the, the I mean, we've had decent growth this last year, but there was a, like, it's, it's no longer growing at that 20% rate. It's plateaued a little bit. It's not perfectly plateaued, so it's still growing. So we're it's probably not safely like, around that estimated 30 million we were at for a long time, or short of, we're probably... Yeah, it's not skyrocketing anymore. Got it. Um, and because of that, Magic's population is now aging past standard. You no longer have people entering that phase, or the same amount of people. So, Aging like F and M at a higher rate than the new players are occupying standard. Correct. Yeah. So, like F and M is no longer F and M is have their numbers are hurting a yeah. little bit. I think that's for a few reasons, but I think one of the reasons is that their aging population is going down, and standard and draft are the main formats of F and M. Right. So that's an issue. The other issue you have here is standards hyper rotation in the last two years. So over the last two years, standard rotated. At you know sixteen or twenty five percent faster than it used to with the new system they've now that they went back on they they have oh, now yeah. fixed this but because of that people were even less willing to invest in the standard especially for part of that there was a point where there were hundred dollar Jace Fringe prodigies which would have were a bad investment I mean right now Jace Fringe prodigy is not worth hundred dollars anymore it's like forty bucks now yeah so that so <laughs> um so that's you know when you're looking at that kind of period of time people became very weary of standard and you still have the problem that these players aren't necessarily jumping onto the modern train because it's expensive, because they have all these standard cards, and no, most of these standard cards don't rotate in the modern. No one's playing Mantis Rider in modern right now. Right. In comes Haruya, which, you know, m my personal theory is that they kind of created this format partly because they had a bunch of Siege Rhinos and, and yeah. <laughs> Mantis Riders in their collection they wanted to sell them, created this new format. Yeah, it's smart. They're pretty influential, so they, they're able to kind of build steam behind it, but there's a huge player base that's looking for a place to take their money, their cards that have rotated standard and still play with them. And this is kind of offering it to them. And kind of with the same death of legacy, modern is moving more into what legacy used to be. Yep. And 
every 10 years, if we were to add a new format to Magic, I can see people wanting to kind of jump on that train. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's kind of essentially, like you said, it's partly what I was saying in the beginning. And I think what you're saying is that because so much time has passed, now Modern does occupy so much more of the space that Legacy once did. It's only going to continue to do that more and more. Which is why Modern's growing. I think think it's kind of each venue is pulling a little bit of the players that were in the previous position. Legacy players are moving into Modern. Yeah, because Legacy is not being supported anymore. And if you want to play Eternal Format, Modern is kind of the main game in town unless you're on Moto. Yeah. And in a Moto, you play Vintage because Black Lotus is an available card. <laughs> and while Modern players is pulling from Legacy, and they're still getting, like Modern is growing, and that's because we're still getting a chunk of players coming from Standard. Right. But because Magic's population is aging faster, and when I say aging, I don't mean physically aging. I mean aging on their Magic cycle. Right. They're faster than they used to. Or and is or the the young the youth of magic doesn't exist at the same levels. There needs to be some kind of middle ground between these two kind of extremes, right? Which is maybe frontier. Yeah, I I don't know. I have a hard time believing that long term frontier is something that is going to be sort of like like revolutionized or be like super super interesting. Um, I think it's a cool like sort of holdover format for people that want to try something new. I think all the reasons that you're talking about are, uh, I think all the reasons you're talking about are great, uh, that, that like p- players do want to use their cards and, and we're hitting that cycle of rotation from a couple years ago where all these new players were coming into the game. Now things are slower. So I see all that and I get all that. Um, but I'm looking at the decks here. Like I have the, I have the metagame pulled up here in front of me and I'm just sort of like, this is all the reasons that I didn't love extended was because I don't really need to see, you know, another four color rally format. Like, I don't necessarily need to, you know what I'm saying? I don't, it's not a bad thing. It's just that like, I, I felt like I pay attention to the tournaments and I play some standard here and there. And the, all the complaints people had of modern, the reason that band list was so intense when it first got launched are the same things I have here, right? Like that's kind of how I feel about it. Well, but that's also temporary. I mean, that's partly because it just exists. The, the, the difference between this and extended or old extended or new extended, sorry, this and new extended was new extended was always going to have that problem. There was never going to be a period in New Extended's life where it wasn't just going to be the last four years worth of standard decks fighting it out. Versus this, because it's an eternal format, or because right. it's a non-rotating format, A, you can invest in this format and you're not wasting your money unless it just dies, it doesn't become popular, which right now it's not popular enough for that. If it's popular enough where your cards are going to be expensive, right. then the investment's going to be fine. But more importantly, this is a format that will grow. I mean, like the in both player base and in size. Like soon... Amaket will be added, and then after that, blah, 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 will be added. But this is one of the only competitive formats where you can currently play Dick Through Time. <laughs> Which is sweet. <laughs> um, and Treasure Cruise. And tre- yeah, yeah. And, yeah, all of the Eldrazi cards and all of the good things. So except, for, except for uh, I have a good you can't play. <laughs> sure. And what's interesting about it is it's a format that exists where these powerful effects aren't broken. It's small enough where you don't have as many of the combinations that you do with older mechanics that didn't really work together. It's part of this, you know, the new New World Order. Most of these sets have existed in a timeline where they knew they were going to do... And in fact, every set here existed in a timeline where they had two sets. They knew that the new set rotation was going to be what's going to happen. That right. we're going to have two sets a year. Even Khans of Tarkir block had a weird mini effect of dragons into this, you know, with dragons where it was kind of a proto version of the two sets two set block system right yeah i I mean i I look at all these decks and they're they're sweet like i can see because that's the thing is that again we're talking about all of these opinions of uh of extended and new extended and modern and being around when it was formed and all like all the reform we've seen over the last five and six years but that doesn't speak to the standard player who started playing 18 months ago and sees a new format that allows them to use their cards longer right which is a completely different experience. It, they don't need a band list. They they liked their standard deck. It's cool they're going to get to play against new standard decks well, with their I old mean, standard deck. And cards will need to be banned. I mean, like, even in block, cards have been banned. Yep. So, like, there will be banned cards in Frontier that's never not going to last. But it is a format that newer players can cycle into. And with the hyper rotation of standard, it allows them to kind of keep their cards specifically for a set. And, and invest in the standard. Because right now... Most of the stand like right now, yes, the cards I listed, like there are modern cards in standard, right? But to have a standard deck that's expensive, most of those cards aren't going to be expensive afterwards. What do you think it means for the magic economy? Is it a positive or a negative? 
I think it's positive. That's kind of what I'm saying. Is now I can invest in a standard deck. Now I can buy my playset of Gideons and Avacyns if I want to play Blue White Flash, knowing that neither of those cards are going to see any modern play in the near future. Because if I want to play Frontier, those cards will cycle into pre- Frontier pretty seamlessly. Interesting. And this is assuming that Frontier is picking up steam, though we don't know. Has Wizards acknowledged it publicly yet? Have they acknowledged it on the site and talked about it? No. It hasn't. This is all... This is but, all... I mean, like, it is growing. Imagine MTG Goldfish, we're literally looking at it right now, has started tracking Frontier as a metagame. Yeah. Um, there was a tournament, you know, FTP, FTF, Sunday Showdown. Like, there's, like, minimal events, but it is growing. Um, it looks like face-to-face games, right? Yeah, face-to-face games and Haruya are the two ones that mainly have had events so far. But... Obviously, it's a new format. Obviously, it's going to be doing things. But there's cool decks here, and there's cool decks here that didn't exist before um, in those standards. And that's kind of how this will exist. There were sets. Like, you know, the Scapeshift decks were the overextended, or the new extended, sorry, version of Valakut decks that were really cool. So there will be new things that kind of get played always. It'll be interesting to see how it evolves. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Uh, um, anything else before we jump on to the end? Uh, I love, I'm looking at your notes here. Great notes, by the way. You have like, you. tons of them. I like that one of your notes is people like playing magic. Oh, yeah. Oh, so that's the last piece. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, I did something. not bring that up. It's one of the reasons people <laughs> might play Frontier. It's the same reason you play Highlander Roulette and Modern, and I play, I have literally a deck for Legacy, Popper, Modern, you have a popper Standard. Deck? Yeah, it's yeah. not good. Don't. We don't want to talk about it. <laughs> it's bad dredge. Um, there's a, I think there's even a good dredge in the format. Mine's not. <laughs> um, Popper, standard, six Highlander decks, plus a second wheel built on my phone, yeah. plus X amount of modern decks, plus the Gauntlet modern decks, plus 10 EDH decks. I like playing Magic. Yeah. I'll pretty much play Magic any opportunity I want. And my problem with standard has always been, or especially in the last two, three years, I can't afford to keep up with standard. Yeah. And this allows me to kind of play in the same place as standard of like, oh, I get to take these new cards that we do our top 10 list for, and only three of those cards in our top 10 list actually see play in Modern, 10 of those cards will see play in Frontier. So it does offer that opportunity. And there is that cool thing, too, and this is and this is probably the part of it that appeals to me the very most, and it's the same thing that appealed to me uh, in in the beginning with Modern, which was great, because back in the beginning with Modern, it was a larger ban list and a smaller card pool. The idea of just a four-drop being unplayable wasn't the way it is now. Right, right when it was announced, it was like you could experiment. So I look at, like... For instance, the four spoilers we just mentioned, and I'm thinking about Quicksmith Rebel, and I'm like, that's a cool card. It's not powerful enough, but it's a cool card. And then I'm like, but there's probably a way to play Quicksmith Rebel in Modern, or in, in Frontier. There's probably a way to, when that card comes out, to make that card sweet for Frontier. And that's that's probably going to be the I case mean, with a lot of cards. I, I don't know if I would use the word probably, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I would say be. you have a must... Uh, I would say you would have a much higher chance other than the fact that there are more artifacts in Modern, but that's a different conversation. Yeah, anyway, that but, card specifically is wonky. But yeah, yeah, that's I, that's kind of the point. Like, there's, It's another format that the world is open to. And I'll play Magic. Give me an opportunity. I'll do it. Yeah. So this is another opportunity. It's a new cool way. It's a way I can just build a Frontier deck and then have it in my backpack just and then just have it available whenever other people want to play. Well, and they've, then, they've also struggled, I know, with the FNM format, as you, as you mentioned recently, uh, with the numbers. And, and Modern has really struggled to be an FNM format as long as, as long as the stores I've known have like been able to sanction it. They just haven't. It hasn't been a thing that's ever picked up at my local store. I do wonder what if Frontier picked up. Would we start playing Frontier on Fridays sometimes? Like maybe if there was a large number of people that wanted to play it, and we could play with sweeter, older cards. That's yeah. It's that's purely dependent on size. I, I think part of the F and M issue is also as Magic's player base is aging, and this is more in the actual term. Like we're all getting a little bit older. Friday nights aren't are a little less designated towards magic time right you're no longer in college you're no longer mid-20s you know you go out you have a girlfriend you have a wife you have a kid you know whatever yeah friday night is no longer really a time you can set aside to play magic so friday night magic as a institution might be lessening in yeah. general yeah and yeah I, I would agree without uh jumping too far down that one i think yeah. that's pretty accurate all right so that's that's um pretty much it on my end for the episode, any, any other notes on, on Frontier? Any decks on this list? I guess we could talk about the different decks. Uh, so right now, the main ones, there's Jeskai. Yep. Classic Jeskai with Monastery, Swiss Spear, um, Mantis Rider, Mono Red playing Rabble Masters, Bant Eldrazi, uh, Espers playing Dick Through Time, you know, all the good stuff. Um, there's the multi-color control, color control, four-color rally back from, from Jace Standard. Yep. 
um, when all the lens existed. There are multiple Bant company decks, um, White Green Company, there's an Abzan, there's a Jun deck. I mean, there's like a kind of a large amount of decks here, probably because this format isn't solved. Ooh, I'm, I'm excited that there's a Grixis and Soul deck. Yeah, I also saw there was like an Insoul aggro deck above there as well. Oh, this deck's sweet. Yeah. <laughs> Chief Engineer, triple Chief Engineer, two Jason Burns Prodigy. Oh, man, I want to play this deck so bad. All right, so two Scuttling Doom Engines. Oh, man. Scuttling let's get on, Doom Let's get on the Frontier trend. Okay. So, yeah, that's that's it on my end. Uh, anything else? Oh, you want to talk about there was some football Star Wars oh, thing on, a, is... our, on our last segment of the podcast that we do once in a while. It's... Okay. Non-magic stuff. I promise you guys this will be somewhat entertaining because it's stupid and funny. So um, on Sundays, I do a job with DirecTV Audience Network. I, I work for a show called Fantasy Zone. If you watch Red Zone ever, it's the, it's the sister show. It's the next channel. I work on both. So anyway, uh, me and the guy that does The Voice uh, and the producer are all big Star Wars fans. We all love Star Wars and we all love like stupid comic books and nerds, whatever, huge nerds. Like <laughs> the conversations that we have when the mic's not on are basically like about old episodes of The Simpsons and Star Wars. And so at one point, once the player in the NFL's name, Quincy Anunwa, came up and we started having the conversation, um, is Anunwa a Star Wars name? Like, yeah, definitely. Quincy Anunwa. And then it was like Darth Anunwa. And then we started talking about, okay, like we, we started to keep our eyes open for what are like the, you know, what's the starting, what's the starting uh, 11 players uh, that, uh, that have Star Wars names in the NFL. And we got pretty far on the list. And I got to say, as a Star Wars fan, Kessler, uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw you a couple and you tell me as a Star Wars expert, do you think these names are legit or not legit for the Star Wars universe? And, and I'll if you have it further, I'll even tell you if they're good guys or bad guys. Okay, and, I'll, and then if you have a question and I need to defend it, I'll tell you, I've come up with characters for a lot of these. All right. Okay, Aqib Talib. Yes, I would say they're the neutral party. Like they're more of like a bounty hunter kind of alien. You think Akib Talib is a bounty hunter? Yeah, I don't know necessarily. Like he's a Jabba Palace kind of guy. I thought Akib Talib was probably a member of the Jedi Council. That's what that I can see that as well. He's essentially Mace. Windu. He's definitely an alien. He's basically Mace. Windu. <laughs> he's basically Mace Windu. That's like what no, I, like I'm imagining. So there's this. Oh, I don't know his name. There's like this big. He's got like a snake tail kind of thing yeah, coming yeah, on, yeah. and he's like got a big Fu uh-huh. Manchu kind of beard. Okay. Um, my personal favorites ever, I'll save for the last two. Okay. Uh, I'll throw you a couple others. Um, Leonte Carew, this is one of my favorites. Definitely, but he's like a young kind of cadet, either pilot or Jedi. Okay, Leonte Carew was my Lando Calrissian. I thought that he like watched over Bespin. Like, okay. I figured. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, All right. Okay, Cody Sensaba, and that's, K- that's C-O-T-Y, Cody Sensaba. Okay, so definitely an alien. Definitely his first name is not his actual first name. That's just what he has shorted it to because it's like 10,000 syllables and you okay. couldn't actually tell anyone it. Sure. Uh, and I'm going to go with Pilot because that's kind of a vague... I liked Pilot. Cody Sensabaugh to me is a woman. And she was a... She that was works a, for me. She was an empire pilot, like a rebellious empire no. pilot. Who likes... She like... She, okay. She falls in love with feared... Uh, feared rebel. <laughs> you um, come up with way longer plot lines yeah. for all these people. Okay. Dak Prescott. Uh, his name is Dak. Yeah, yeah. His yeah. name is Dak. Dak Prescott's yeah. my Han Solo, basically, and and okay. the way and the way I figured is Dak Prescott goes to like infiltrate uh, like the Death Star and Cody Sensabaugh. Are these all football players? Yeah, they're okay. all football players. <laughs> Sweet, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and Cody Sensabaugh is like the rebellious rebel, and she falls she falls for Dak, and okay. they steal the plans, and they elope, and they like fly off in a Tie Fighter or something like that. Anyway, um, only one person can run in a Tie yeah. Fighter. Uh, I'm gonna continue. keep I'm gonna keep going. Make it a B wing. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, they have two seats. People have turned off the podcast. Um, no, no, no. They love this. Come on. Need more football players. There's some sweet ones. I'm still saving my last two. Okay. Um, okay. I gave you Aqib Tlaib. I gave you Cody Sensabaugh, Dak Prescott. We have seven minutes until we're at an hour, and then we'll stop it. <laughs> yeah. Um, what were some of the other ones that I'd come up with? I just don't want to share my favorites. All right, Say your favorites. I'll, I'll give you my. It. I'll give you my favorite ever. Okay. And then, and then with the one that I think is better, but it's not my favorite, Orleans Darkwa. Orleans Darkwa. Uh, Sith. Orleans Darkwa. That's uh, 100%. My, that's like my, yeah, he's, of course. Or he's like, I don't know if he's Sith yet, but he's like definitely going down that path. Orleans Darkwa is a Sith Lord. He has dark in his last name. <laughs> he, was the, he was the original favorite of the, of the conversation. He's where the whole thing started. Was with I don't Or- know. I mean, like, Big Dark Lighter is a good guy. So I don't want to even say that dark is a guaranteed sign of. And Gavin Dark Lighter eventually led Rogue Squadron. Orleans Darkwa. universe that doesn't exist anymore. Orleans Dark Lighter's younger brother. Darkwa was the one that we were like, forever, we're like, we don't know if Darkwa is like it could also be a Lord of the Rings thing. On the seventh day, look at the North Hill. You'll see a man there, Orleans Darkwa, or like, or like Orleans Darkwa could be like, I knew your father, Orleans Darkwa. He was a pupil of mine. Yeah, right. This all fits. Yeah, exactly. All yeah, right. yeah. And my single favorite ever, feared bounty hunter, Barcavius Mingo. 
Yes, definitely. Works Farcavius for Mingo yeah, is yeah. Bosque, basically. Like, no, he's not. He doesn't sound like he sounds like a human. Really? Yeah, that's definitely a human name. Farcavius Mingo. Yeah, that's yeah. So sweet. I mean, like it's a weird planet, but yeah, definitely a human. I think he plays for the Patriots. Um, <laughs> they're all real names. Worst, worst team in the country. Oh, oh, oh! And then sorry, the most recent one, which sure. is he's a young, he's a young, uh, like a Jedi. He's like probably one of the younglings that Anakin, Anakin kills. Quan Bray. <laughs> Yeah, definitely one of the young leagues. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you guys are football fans, I hope you enjoyed that as much as we do on Sundays. Uh, I did not enjoy any of the football references, but I'll talk Star Wars with you and tell you one. Are sure. you excited for Rogue One? Oh, so excited. Yeah. I like need to ask you off air if you have a ticket for me because I got lucky and last time you did. I may... But I just asked you on air. So I, I, <laughs> I vaguely might be going to the premiere. Oh, no. But really? But I think I'm trying to get tickets also to see it a second time. Okay. Um, and I am getting two. So you may be able to take that second one. Well, I would love to go if, as long as it's not on Saturday the 17th during the day. I would be expecting it to be Friday and or Thursday at midnight. I'm knowing so Knowing the Alex Kessler way of seeing Star Wars Psyched. Movies. I can't so wait. I will, I will cheer so hard. For those who don't know, if you ever want to see a movie with me that I am excited for, I love seeing it on opening day weekends and I love shouting. During and the seeing Star, and I'm a seeing big Star clapper. Wars movie nine times in theaters. I saw it seven times. Yeah, because it's episode seven. And it was so sweet. It was really good. I like really like it. It was really interesting. The last four times were me watching it because people would complain at me about the movie. Yeah, and then me watching to see what their complaints are and see if the movie had good answers for it. Sure. Uh, I think it's great. I, I think they did a great job. I think it was kind of a repeat of a, the A New Hope, but yep. on the other hand, this was a new version of the movie for kids. Totally. And. Uh, the second act had a lot of problems, but the first act and third act were both kind of perfect. Yeah, sweet. Yeah. All right. So thanks, everybody, for listening. We'll talk to you guys next week. Uh, yeah. And uh, tweet at us if you have a sweet deck you want to play on Frontier. I want to see what deck you would play. Uh, not, And it doesn't have to be one of the ones on MTG Goldfish. I'd love to see if you have some cool ideas for the format. Sick. All right. Bye, guys. Bye, everybody. Thank you for your attention. See you later, alligator. <laughs>